Good morning. I'm your host, Gautaman M., Faculty, Department of Political Science, Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science. I welcome you to the webinar series, Nation Building Through Civil Services from August 10 to 13, 2020, which aims to empower the future leaders for the nation through conversations with civil, service, civil servants and policymakers. The webinar series is hosted by Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, Coimbatore, in partnership with Shankar IAS Academy, Chennai, and Takshashila Institution, Bengaluru. These three institutions excel in their domains. Class offers the most unique liberal arts education, including degree program in political science, and has Kumaraguru Civil Services Academy in partnership with Shankar IAS Academy. Shankar IAS Academy coaches and mentors aspiring civil servants and in the recently declared UPSC CAC results, 201 students of Shankar IAS Academy cleared the examination that is 25% of the total results declared. The Takshashila Institution is an independent center for research and education in public policy. We are happy to present the fifth talk in the webinar series, Climate Change and Pandemic, we will have an in-depth presentation on the topic for one hour, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. Please post your questions on the comment section. This session is live streamed in the FP and YouTube of class and the YouTube of Shankar IAS Academy. We welcome all the participants for the conversation on climate change and pandemic presented by Sundar Rajan, Mr. Sundar Rajan. Mr. Sundar Rajan can be best described in lighter vein as a full-time environmental activist and part-time software professional. An avid and passionate environmentalist, he believes it is important to translate his passion into action in an effort to do his bit for the earth. As part of Puvulagin Nanbargar, Mr. Sundar Rajan has been in the forefront of many struggles in Tamil Nadu on issues that have jeopardized the environmental makeup, the latest being the struggle against nuclear plant at Kodankulam in Southern Tamil Nadu. As core member of Puvulagin Nanbargal, a 25-year-old movement formed by like-minded individuals who are professionals in their respective domains, Sundar Rajan, along with the team, has been instrumental in propagating the ideals of environment protection and safety in Tamil Nadu. Mr. Sundar Rajan is also a part of the editorial team of Puvulagin Magazine, a monthly magazine that covers a wide range of issues including eco-politics, eco-economics, organic farming, water issues, creative work with a focus on environmental safety, student section, Q&A, and contemporary issues. He worked in various platforms for promoting environmental consciousness and awareness among public. He created widespread awareness against nuclear energy in various places and worked with different groups working against nuclear reactors in Kalpakam and Kurangula. He was adjudged as top 10 person by the popular Tamil media group Anand Vigadan in the year 2012 and was awarded Nambike Tamilan award by Pudhiya Talamurai channel. So we have Mr. Sundar Rajan sir with us. Over to you sir. Good morning to you all. Uh, thanks, Gautam, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be part of uh, this conversation being organized by Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science in association with uh, Shankar Academy, Shankar IAS Academy, and also a few other institutes uh, in our country. Uh, uh, nation building through civil services is uh, the you know, overall uh, topic of this conference con conversation. My, my topic today is uh, climate change and pandemics. So that is what I am going to share a few thoughts uh, on this aspect about the climate change and pandemics. Uh, friends, um, we humans have this uh, uh, you know, alpha species syndrome, you know, which is called as you know, alpha species. We think that uh, we are an alpha species in this earth and we will be able to, uh, we are a dominating species in this earth and we, are, we will be able to overcome any kind of uh, uh, natural calamity or pandemics or any other thing. So we believe that, uh, you know, unfortunately, we believe that we are a uh, dominant species and we are an alpha species. 
where we are above every other 80 lakh species in this world. But the truth is, we are just another species in this 80 lakh or more species in this world. Humans are just another species. We forget, we you know, largely tend to forget this uh, idea of being biodiversity or being you know, value chain, human chain, food chain, whatever it is. So we have this uh, strong notion that uh, we will be able to overcome any sort of pandemics or any sort of uh, natural disasters. It may be true in some sense uh, because humanity has seen a large and many, you know, many worse pandemics than uh, COVID-19. I don't deny that. In the 6th century, the world faced a, a pandemic named uh, Justinian Plague. This Justinian Plague was um, prevalent mostly in the you know, one of the large empires in this world, the world has ever seen, called the Byzantine Empire. This Byzantine Empire had Constantinople as the capital and it spread across Turkey, modern Turkey, Iran, Iraq, to Egypt and the, you know, to the southern part of Europe. So that's, that's, that's a so huge empire. And the uh, emperor who ruled at that point of time when this pandemic strike was, uh, pandemic strike was uh, uh, called as Justinian Emperor. So this pandemic was named behind him as a Justinian plague. It killed thousands and lakhs and crores of people in the next 30, 40 years. And in the next few hundred years, the Byzantine Empire crumpled down uh, into small pieces only because of this uh, Justinian plague pandemic. In the 13th century, the world saw another pandemic by the name of uh, Black Death. You know, it, it, uh, it spread like anything. Crores and crores of people died because of this Black Death. And the uh, influence of uh, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church came, started to come down only because of this Black Death. Because the emperor was uh, ha having his hands tied. The official missionary was having its hands tied. They couldn't do anything to stop this pandemic. And the Catholic Church was also simply looking cluelessly during these times of pandemic. So the, the influence of Catholic Church came down post Black Death. In the 18th century, we, sp we saw Spanish flu. We saw many other pandemics like smallpox, polio, many other pandemics. I don't deny that fact. Humanity has overcome those pandemics, uh, uh, you know, using uh, vaccines or therapeutic medicines. We have overcome that. I don't deny that fact. I don't deny that fact. But there's a huge difference be between those pandemics and the pandemics that the humanity is facing in the last 100 years, specifically in the last 30 years. There's a huge difference. You know, uh, smallpox was because of a virus called variola. Polysmithis is the disease caused by polio virus. Those are all pure, plain pathogens. Only viruses are bacteria. Only viruses are bacteria or any pathogens. Those, those pandemics were caused just by pathogens. So when, when we find uh, therapeutic medicine or when we find, when we invent uh, vaccines, those viruses will get deactivated and we will not have much trouble after that. But the humanity, whatever the diseases that we face in the last 100 years, especially in the last 30 years, 35 years, it's all 70, 60 percent of those uh, pathogens or 60 percent of those diseases that humans get due to pathogens is because of zoonotic diseases or zoonosis. Zoonotic diseases means the viruses spreads from wildlife to humans. Either it will have an intermediate host or it may not have the intermediate host, but it spreads from, uh, you know, uh, wildlife to humans. So to, to, we, may have, we may claim that we have overcome uh, smallpox, we have overcome polio because we have found some vaccine or because of the improvement in sanitation, we have overcome many pandemics. I don't deny that. But because these are pathogens that have creeped upon humans, because there is a destruction in the natural ecosystem, it is very difficult to tackle them. It's very difficult to understand them. It is also very difficult to stop the spread of these diseases. What is the break in the ecological cycle that has happened? I would like to quote three examples. It was in the year 1994. Uh, there's a kind of city called Brisbane in Australia. We all know that. And in Brisbane had a suburban area called Hendra. Like what we have in Chennai, we have got a Tambaram, a suburban area. In Brisbane, they have got a suburban area named Hendra. That Hendra is famous for horse races. So there used to be a lot of horse staples, paddocks, horse, you know, um, race grounds, race courses, and many other things. That entire region was full of uh, stuff related, materials related to uh, institutions related to horses. It was very famous for that area to have horse races every now and then. 
and there was this staple uh, trainer or staple owner by named Vikrail. He is a very very enthusiastic uh, horse trainer under owner of a horse stable. He had a fantastic horse named Drama Series. The uh, name of the horse was Drama Series. The Drama Series horse was very famous in that region. It used to win many races. It used to win many medals, cups, trophies, and many other things. Whenever the people come to know that the Drama Series uh, horse is part of that race, there used to be a huge turnaround. People just come to see those races run only because of Drama Series. It was so popular and so you know uh, fabulous that the horse was winning many trophies and races. Every human, every everybody in that uh, region will know Drama Series by its name. Post after it, the Drama Series uh, horse retired, it got uh, conceived, it got pregnant. So uh, the, this uh, trainer Vikrail had a habit of taking his horses in the morning to a paddock where it used to graze uh, and leave it there and he will go and bring them back in, in the evening. So one such day in September 1994, uh, as usual, uh, he picked up all the horses, took to that paddock and he left those horses for grazing and he came back. After a few hours, he since he left the horses uh, for grazing, he got a call from that area, that paddock region, that somebody called a big rail and said, the drama series horse is looking very tired and is just you know, trying to sleep. It is not very active. There is some issue. Why don't you come soon? So uh, Vikrail was uh, doing some work. He was busy, held up in something. So he called his um, uh, girlfriend, Lisa Simons, and he asked her to go and see what is happening there. So Lisa Simons went with the trailer and she, she saw a drama series horse just lying down with a lot of tired and with less energy. It was almost like very, very fragile. So she picked up the horse, put it in the trailer, came back to the uh, stable and the, in the stable Vikriel saw it was having cracks in the mouth, it was having lumps all over the face. He couldn't understand what is the problem. So he immediately reached out to the uh, veterinary doctor nearby, uh, Mr. Peter Raid. He called this guy and said, uh, my heart's drama series is having some problem, why don't you come quickly as quick as possible. So Peter Raid came immediately and saw this horse. When he opened the mouth of the horse, he, he was seeing the leftover of the carrot that the horse was eating. The horse was not able to even complete or finish the carrot that it was eating. It was so sick. It was so sick that it couldn't finish even its food. And Peter Reed also couldn't uh, understand why this suddenly happened. So he gave some antibiotics. He gave some medicines and said, you take care of it and call me for any other emergency. I am available. And he went back. Next day morning, uh, the uh, stable worker, the uh, worker who works in the uh, stable, he called up uh, Peter Reed the next day morning, 4 o'clock. He called Peter Reed and said, uh, you came and you know uh, gave some medicines for drama series hearts yesterday. That horse is almost dying. Can you come quickly? So Peter Reed would rush to that spot and see, uh, you know, drama series horse slowly dying. He couldn't save that horse. The he was shell shocked. Immediately after that, there will be a lot of rumor theories. Like now, what we are saying that China manufactured COVID-19, China manufactured SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there will be a lot of theories, a lot of you know, uh, 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 false theories. I would say. Uh, or conspiracy theories, I would say, that started to flow after that drama series passed away. One, two such theories where, you know, uh, Vikrail was under a huge debt and he couldn't maintain a huge stable of horses and he would poison the drama series horse because he couldn't uh, keep the drama series horse uh, uh, with, with full attention or full uh, resources because he was under debt. And there's one more theory that, you know, stable owners nearby, owners of nearby stables would have poisoned the drama series because they were all jealous of this horse because it was winning race after race in the when it was very active. All these uh, conspiracy theories were going on for a week till every horse in the Vikriel's uh, stable got sick and the horses near the horses near Vikriel's stable got sick. Even Vikriel got sick and was seriously admitted in the hospital. So hundreds of horses would die and few horses would require ethrensia, which is uh, Mercy killing because the horses couldn't, couldn't withstand the pain, withstand the disease. They were dying left, right, center. Even Vikrail would pass away. The staple worker, the worker in the staple also was seriously, critically ill and he was hospitalized. So suddenly that area would become so active, so so tense that you know hundreds of horses belonging to Hendra are dying. A human has died. 
another human would be seriously ill and it would be he would be in hospitalized hospitalized the whole area would become so tense and you know a lot of movements would happen the brisbane local county would immediately set up a committee belonging to the department of primary industries because in that region department of primary industries was respo- was responsible for <coughs> Uh, animal husbandry for veterinary so they would form a committee with animal husbandry doctors veterinary doctors virologists epidemiologists and many others and they would start work immediately they would collect blood samples for from all the horses that that would have lost their lives because of this disease and they would also collect the sample of wick rail they will start comparing the the genome sequencing or <coughs> the genome structure of those horses and the genome of uh, big rail would match so they they think that the same disease that the horses has infected has got transferred to big rail and they would they couldn't come to a conclusion what would be the reason for such a uh, massive uh, pandemic they would compare this genome sequence with the ahs which is african horse sickness and many other viruses they couldn't match there would be some difference from those uh, uh, genome structures and the present genome structure so they have come to a conclusion that this is a new virus and what would be the name of the virus since that region since that area is called as hendra the virus would be named as hendra from that day on the virus was named as hendra virus but the perplexity but the purple but the uh, puzzle did not solve there this puzzle was actually where did this virus come from which was the host which was the intermediate host how did it get spread and then they will find out there will be trees in the paddocks where the horses go for grazing so in those paddocks there will be bat eating uh, uh, bowal uh, bat, sorry sorry fruit eating bats sorry sorry for the slip uh, it would be fruit eating bats uh, fruit eating bats were the host for the hendra virus but they were perplexed you know this fruit eating bats were there in australia for 2 and 1/2 crore years two more than 2 crore years gangaroos were there for more than 2 crore years cola or beer would be there for two more than 2 crore years why this hendra virus or the you know forefathers of hendra virus did not affect the kangaroo or did not affect the cola or beer why is that then they will find out that for the past 2 and 1/2 crore years kangaroos the cola or beers and the fruit eating bats have evolved you know mutually and they were mutually coexistent so all those evolution has brought in lot of immunity to those gangaroos and colar bears so that this hendra virus or their or its forefathers couldn't affect the gangaroos or the colar bears but the horses were pretty new to australia the europeans took those horses only 200 years back when they went to capture australian land from the from the original inhabitants so till that then australia didn't have a horses so this europeans took horses to australia and since horses were very new to that geography it didn't have the immunity for hendra viruses this hendra virus was waiting for 2 and 1/2 crore years for the horses to come and to infect those horses and then to humans thus was born the hendra virus the zoonotic virus or zoonosis or zoonotic disease in 1996 uh, there was a tribal village in uh, congo milibe it was also with the forest it's an excellent village but only 150 tribes that forest was so deep and dense there is huge trees you know tall trees very broad trees it would attract anybody the french were so attracted with those forest so they went went there cut those trees for the furnitures and many other things to be made in france so they laid very you know large and wide uh, highways so that this uh, large trees could be carried to carried using trailers could reach the ports and it can reach the france uh, france country so they built huge roads all the forests were getting destroyed and they gave uh, guns to the tribals so that they will protect the uh, woodlocks from the people who would try to smuggle it so they were given guns so tribals started to hunt using guns they hunted chimpanzees they hunted chimpanzees and started to eat the flesh and meat of chimpanzees and thus was born ebola otherwise there was no ebola there was no hiv till then i mean previous to that ebola was the main disease in 1996 in 1997 there was a huge forest fire in indonesia like what we have now dealing with amazon forest fire 
the people there in indonesia wanted to destroy those forests and make it grazing or use those resources because those resources are to be used for you know for electricity for any other thing so they were having uh, a day with fire is a norm today in amazon where people you know celebrate the uh, uh, forest burning with fire for a day so that they could grace they could bring down huge vast uh, numbers of trees and it could be available for grazing for their cattle they will slaughter those cattle and export meat and you know uh, the leather for for various purposes so like that in 1997 uh, the indonesian forest fire was so huge so lot of eat bat eat uh, fruit eating bats came out of forest in large numbers in large numbers because they couldn't survive of the heat they couldn't survive the forest fire they came out they came out to the fields nearby where the farmers were having their farms and also they had huge trees with fruits so these bats used to come out of the forest eat those fruits which, which were in the farms or fields of the farmers the fruits the remaining fruits will fall down with its saliva and there were pigs or uh, there were boars which used to eat those fruits and thus was born nipa virus otherwise we didn't have nipa virus nipa virus again came back to kerala in 2013 friends there's a huge difference variola is a virus only a pathogen which could not trigger from uh, wildlife to humans it was a pathogen we were able to eliminate or deactivate those pathogens and the humanity survived smallpox and we were able to eliminate many other pandemics using some improvement in sanitation and improvement in various other improvement in various other therapeutic medicines or or uh, vaccines but this is not the same this is not the same why we are not able to find out a medicine for uh, hiv for ebola for nipa for mers sars yellow fever there many other diseases in the last 30 35 years since 1981 till 2018 humanity has lost 3 3 crore and 25 lakh people in the last 30 years because of because of zoonotic diseases only friends because of only zoonotic diseases the humanity has lost world over about 3.25 crore people because of zoonoses or because of zoonotic viruses many other diseases i would say i could have a list of those diseases to be to be said to you but it's a huge list and and there is a huge difference between these two pathogens today a couple of weeks back the there is a huge mink farm mink is a small wild animal small animal which is being used for fur for for its uh, you know uh, the for leather products only for its fur so there is a huge farm in uh, uh, netherlands where they have to cull or they have to kill roughly about 3.25 sorry 10 lakh uh, minks 10 lakh minks in the last couple of weeks back because uh, the corona virus had gone and affected the uh, bing farm and since it was spreading to uh, wildlife wild animals also they they have to cull about 10 lakh 1 million mink you could check in internet you can check in google that 1 lakh 1 million minks were culled couple of weeks back in netherlands because corona has started to affect those minks since it is zoonotic diseases since it diseases from animals tomorrow we might find a vaccine or a therapeutic medicine and this corona virus can go and stay with any other animal it could genetically mutate and come back as a different species in the in the next 10 15 years so friends there's a lot of difference pathogens are mere pathogens when it is like variola or the polio virus but these are all zoonoses which can which is caused due to the you know break in the ecological science, uh, chain or uh, in the in the ecological cycle because of that pathogens get released and humans get that is why ian lipkin a world known world renowned epidemiologist said in the month of march that the world has not yet seen the peak of corona the world has not yet seen the peak of corona not only that the world is yet to see much larger and much worse pandemics than corona because of climate change that's what uh, ian lipkin said in the month of march in an interview to india today so friends i would like to quote four eight, four main reasons why these kind of pandemics why these kind of viruses why these kind of zoonotic diseases happens with humans in a very large numbers especially in the 30 i mean mainly for the 100 years but especially specifically in the last 30 40 years why is that what are the key reasons virologists globally have said 
four reasons as key reasons why this corona corona like pandemics happen in this world the number one reason primary reason is habitat loss whose habitat the habitat of wild animals where do they live the wild animals habitat are forest the wild animals habitat is are deep dense forest so this forest are being exploited by humans like us for dams for minerals for mining for roads for electricity for many other things we are we are encroaching the forest areas so when we encroach the forest areas the interaction between the wild animals wild life and humans are increasing and we are getting uh, zoonotic viruses or zoonotic diseases like ebola like nipa like sars cov 2 which is our covid 19 which is which is the present pandemic is covid 19 so first reason is habitat loss and also there is one more reason do we do we get this uh, diseases every day no we don't get so when do we get them the, the scientists and virologists have said that it's called as uh, zoonotic spillover so when does this spillover happen when this wildlife gets stressed when this wildlife gets complete stress like humans when we get stress what do we get we get uh, uh, blood pressure we get diabetes we get cardiac problems like that when human when wildlife get this stress either through excreta or through saliva this virus gets transmitted to another 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 uh, another species it could be an intermediate host in in this case it is the intermediate host is pangolin in in covid 19 the host the primary source is bats the intermediate host is pangolin and the final destination is humans in mers it was horses in nipa the intermediate host was wild boar or pigs in in middle east in in mers um, in mers it is camel in middle east expert is intermediate camel in sars it is horses so there there could be an intermediate host where it gets mutated further it comes to humans or uh, there are certain cases where you will not have the intermediate host it comes to directly to humans so the primary reason is the habitat loss so the zoonotic spillover happens through excreta or through saliva when the wildlife gets more stress because of the loss of its habitat we need to understand why we are against deforestation is and there is a study in scientific american couple of months back which says if deforestation is increased by 10% than it what have what it happens now then globally about 35 lakh people will get dengue and malaria more than what they are what we are getting now so friends deforestation or habitat loss of wild animals is the primary reason for uh, pandemics like uh, uh, corona or nipa or nebola to get spread number 2 is the number 2 reason is uh, urbanization in india the number of covid cases in india about 60% of those cases are in five major cities chennai mumbai delhi ahmedabad thane these five cities have about 60% of corona cases in india in the us about 35% of its corona cases corona patients or corona positive patients live in new york city alone so urbanization is a second primary reason for pandemics like this why is that because in a village for example when i my when i went, went to my village immediately news got spread that i am from chennai the primary source of covid so people got alert and and we also did not go over till we get got tested we became negative we were quarantined but 14 days so in a small village you will be able to know who is having what even people they themselves come forward and they isolate themselves in villages but in urban in urban towns and cities you may not know who is having this corona disease you may not know because it's very wide spread and you don't have you don't have interactions with everybody living in your vicinity or in your neighborhood you don't have that so urbanization is a second reason for pandemics like corona to spread and the third reason is illegal wet meat trade you know uh, like this uh, um, wuhan market which is a wet market it's an illegal market where in the one side they had hundreds of bats you know being kept being kept being caught for either for 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 medicine or for food or whatever it is so bats in bats are on one side pangolins are on other side so this covid this corona sars cov 2 virus that's the name of the virus sars cov 2 virus you know because of the stress in the bats it got transferred to pangolins and from pangolins to human beings and thus we have got covid 19 pandemic so number third number 3 is the third reason is illegal 
uh, illegal hunting, illegal trade is the third reason. And the fourth reason is weakening of our antimicrobial resistance, or which is called as AMR. Humans have inherently have a, a you know, natural immunity system called the antimicrobial resistance. So when we when some pathogens affect us, so this immunity system or the antimicrobial resistance, they produce some antibodies, and they and these antibodies goes and deactivates those pathogens. And this information gets stored in the immunity system, in the memory of the immunity system, so that when sometime, when next time, when the same pathogens affects us, so this memory, this uh, uh, memory of the immunity system sends these antibodies to deactivate those pathogens. And so we have got a robust antimicrobial resistance. But today what is happening? Because of the overuse and abuse of uh, antibiotics, either we take more antibiotics or we take antibiotics when it's not required. So overuse and abuse of antibiotics has, has weakened this AMR, which is, which is called as the next pandemic, the weakening of antimicrobial resistance, friends. Not only that, you know, uh, uh, industrial meat production, we take a lot of broiler chickens, right? So those broiler chickens are, are being given a lot of antibiotics so that no, no pathogens could affect those broiler chickens. Those uh, chickens are also given growth simulators. So though you don't have to wait 150 days, 200 days to get a full chicken, you can get it in uh, you know, 40 days, 60 days, because they are, they are given growth simulators and antibiotics. So what we do, we take those meat, you know, the meat which is uh, treated with antibiotics and also with growth simulators, so which also weakens our antimicrobial resistance, which is AMR. So these four are the key reasons, friends, why we humanity has getting pandemics like uh, COVID-19. Not only that, not only that, I would like to add two more important points. You know, I'll, maybe I'll speak for another 10, 15 minutes and then we can go into the question and answer session, I think. So um, not only that, in 2019, uh, November, uh, October, November, world-renowned uh, medical journal called Lancet, it published a health report titled Climate and Health. Climate and Health is the title of the report. You know what that report said? If you ask me in one line, if you ask me to say, what did that report say? The report said, climate change will undo the progress that the humanity has achieved in the last 150 to 200 years in terms of public health. It will undo, climate change will undo the progress that the humanity has achieved in the last 150 to 200 years in terms of public health is what the Lancet report said. And we are facing it, friends. You know, in 2018, IPCC, Intergovernmental Plan on Climate Change said that the world has got only 12 years to stop the destruction that would come out of uh, climate change. We'll have to reduce our carbon emission by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 20, net zero by 2050. Net zero means how much ever carbon that the oceans and the forests could absorb, only those amount of carbon, only that amount of carbon, the humanity can, you know, can um, give out or can uh, use it. Uh, otherwise, humanity will face a you know, huge destruction, the IPCC report said. And it said, since the permafrost is high, permafrost is the ice in the you know, polar, Tibet and other regions. Since permafrost is thawing, thawing means defreezing. Since permafrost is thawing, all the ancient viruses are coming out. And in 2015, 14, 15, virologists across the globe have come and researched and found out 33 ancient virus families. It is not viruses. Corona is a family. SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV-2 are family viruses of Corona. So like that in Tibet in 2014-15, they have found out 33 ancient family viruses in Tibet alone. You, then you have got Arctic, then you have got Antarctic, then you have got Siberia, then you have got Iceland, Alps, Greenland. All these places are now, the permafrost is decreasing or thawing, which are bound to create or give many ancient diseases to humans. The issue here is, we, we modern humans know how the corona-like virus is spread. For example, corona, SARS-CoV-2 uses our respiratory tract and it affects the lungs and it, we get COVID-19. 
but those ancient viruses are pretty new are pretty old which were active about 500 years to 15000 years back 500 years to 15000 years back today modern human may not know modern human may not know what that virus is how those diseases spread what is the kind of diseases that humans would get what is what are the diseases that the human would get modern humans may not know about those viruses because those are all ancient virus families so that is why leon lipkin the virologist as i mentioned earlier the epidemiologist said the world is yet to see the peak of corona not only that the world will see much worse pandemics than covid 19 due to climate change and i would like to again quote what lancet report said that climate change will undo the progress that the humanity has achieved in the last 150 to 200 years in terms of public health is what the lancet report said not only that friends not only that this ancient viruses that i mentioned i have already started to come out in arctic because norway and russia are digging for oil in the arctic region and uh, summer free arctic will be in the next 10 years summer during summer you will not have sorry ice free summers in arctic will be happening in the next 10 20 years and himalayas will lose its lose its uh, about 40 to 50% of its snow in the next 20 in the next 20 odd years we are saying in 2020 2040 is what they say the himalayas will lose its snow cover in the next 20 years arctic will become arctic will have ice free summers in the next 10 15 years so climate change is threatening the existence of humanity the existence of the species in this earth that is why ipbs when they released a report in 2018 that the world is heading towards the sixth mass extinction sixth mass extinction in the next you know two or three decades we were all shell shocked and the sixth mass extinction will may it may ensure the extinction of human beings as a species because ipbs comes out with an art with a research paper every two to three years once and the first time in 2018-19 they have said that the loss of one million species in the next 10 or next few decades may ensure the human beings become extinct friends it's a very very dangerous sign i'm not we are getting double disasters triple disasters we have got uh, uh, you know in the last six years tamil nadu faced about six disasters Tane, Wokki, Gaja, Varda, four cyclones, Chennai floods, fifth, fifth disaster. Now, Corona pandemic. In six years, Chennai alone has faced six pandemic, six disasters. India has got many, many disasters. Last year alone, India had about 1,000 extreme rainfall events. Yesterday, what happened in Kerala and Munar? You know, Kerala used to get about 3,000 millimeter of rainfall over a period of three, three and a half months or four months. Today, they are getting within a month of 3,000 millimeter of rainfall. Within a month, within a month, they are getting about 3,000 millimeter of rainfall. So friends, we are we are facing double disaster, triple disaster. When, when, when India is facing Corona pandemic, when India is facing, you know, uh, Corona COVID-19 pandemic, we are getting Nirsaka storm. We are getting Umban storm. Sorry, my, my batteries, you know, just allow me to charge it. Uh, we are getting Nirsaka storm. We are getting, you know, Umban storm when world when in, in India is facing, you know, COVID pandemic. Sorry for that. I didn't know that. I didn't plug it. Uh, plug the uh, charger. Uh, so when when we are facing, you know, double disasters, pandemic is one side, cyclones are other side. Suddenly we are getting desert locust on the other side. So we are the world is facing dual disasters and triple disasters. Friends, I am not here to you know uh, frighten you or show or instill a, a you know seed of fear among you. I have come here to instill hope to you. Humanity can thrive. Humanity can overcome these disasters. We have got the technologies. We have got the solutions. What we don't have is the mindset and the political will to do these changes. We are not against development. But the question today in front of us is, it's no more a question of environment versus development. It's a question of survival versus extinction, friends. Are we going to survive? Or as a humanity, are we going to become extinct? You might think that the humanity has faced five mass extinctions earlier. So why do you cry? Why do you, there is a human cry about the six mass extinction that may happen in this near future. Why you know? 
when those five uh, mass extinction happened there was no human being as a species at that point of time all those mass extinction happened either due to meteoroid strike from other other uh, galaxies and milky way or other uh, novas or either through volcanic eruption that happened in this earth mostly it is through meteoroid strikes which would, which could happen from you know other uh, planets or other uh, galaxies so now a species anthropogens are responsible for a mass extinction is really a factor of worry my dear friends friends 1998 there was a huge there was a you know multilateral negotiation that happened happened in arhas a city in denmark it was called as the arhas convention charter the convention charter you know gave a clarion call it said the environmental laws have to be made not only to protect the environment not only to protect the ecology but also to ensure the intergenerational equity environmental laws should ensure the in the intergenerational equity the people today people who are we are living today has to live has to live at least this kind of an environment to a to a generation which could come about 100 years 200 years after so that intergenerational equity is the main purpose of environment laws environment uh, act and also that and also it added one more thing since this laws rules and acts are framed by anthropogens or by humans we don't care about the other species so when you have any enact a law when you enact rules when you enact notifications you should keep that no tigers no elephants enact this kind of laws it is humans who are who are responsible or who are enacting this laws so you don't care about other species which is a worrisome factor in this whole ecology cycle or this ecosystem so when you enact a law or when you when you come out with a notification you will have to ensure that you know other species are taken into taken into account don't make it as only for anthropogens or only for humans friends i am not i am i would like to you know end uh, this uh, conversation with a positive note i am sure most of you would know about wangari matai she was the first african woman to get peace prize nobel peace prize till she got she till she was announced for the prize the world did not know about wangari matai so when she went to get receive that prize she came back she she came out of the hall and there huge battery of international journalists who were standing there because the world did not know about wangari matai till then so this international journalist asked her who are you if i was i was there i would have said that i am sundar rajan i am from tamil nadu i i am part of co like in anbargal i run a software company i blah 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 but she is wangari matai you know so she said a story you know there's a there's huge forest fire all the animals like tigers like elephants uh, bears lions were all sleeping idle there was a small bird humming bird which was which flew to the nearby water body took a drop of water and small beak came and dropped over the fire thinking that it will be able to dose off that fire it was not doing once huh? it was doing continuously it will fly to the water body take one drop of water come back to the fire drop it go back come back go back so it was continuously doing it for many a times after few hours a rabbit called this hummingbird and asked are you mad it asked the hummingbird are you mad you are able to see huge large big animals like elephant it could take a large chunk of water in its trunk and blow it over the fire and the fire might the fire might douse off you have got tigers you have got lions which which could do to douse off the fire but you are only put on you are on little little creature like a hummingbird what can you do the rabbit asked hummingbird hummingbird replied i will do what i can do to the best of my ability till that time that i will that i can do so this story reached all the other animals they all came forward and they dosed out the fire wangari mata i said i would like to be a hummingbird of this world friends we have come to an era where every one of us every one of you every one of every one has to become a humming bird potential would be civil aspirants who are listening to this speech you have got a huge responsibility in your hands next 10 years are going to be the key to save this earth or to save humanity from major mass destruction so whenever you become a civil servant whenever you become a civil service officer 
have any any kind of any any service it could be ias ips ifs any any service so please remember this mind when you sign in files you will have to think at second what would be the impact of this project or this scheme or this policy on the environment should be the primary focus of your understanding i think my our conversation today for more than about 45 50 minutes today would have would have given you a bit of information there is a huge amount of information available online you can come to our website kuvulaga.org or our facebook pages or twitter pages we have got an immense amount of uh, information in tamil uh, if you want in english there are a lot of other other sites like you know uh, uh, unfcc or ipcc so there are a lot of many other sites to give you information on english there are many other things which you could gather to know more what i have given is maybe not even a tip of the iceberg but, but there are a lot many issues that are confronting the humanity as a whole today friends i think um, in that in that backdrop uh, i would like to leave by saying that uh, you no know, you can curse us i belong to a generation i'm 45 plus now so you could curse us that i belong to a generation which spoiled this earth which screwed up this earth yes i agree i don't i don't deny that i belong to a generation which entirely spoiled this earth i don't deny that but my question to you is what are you youngsters going to do to save this only dwelling place that we have got it is you are earth you are going to live you know probably i could live another 15 20 years i have already got my boarding card i am in between the arrival launch and departure launch i could take the flight and move in the next 15 20 years time but you are going to live in the next 50 years 60 years your children are going to survive in this earth for generations to come so my question to you is you can curse us you curse us i don't i don't want to deny that but what are you as a future citizen of this or the present citizen of this earth going to do to save this save this only dwelling place of human beings what is you what are you going to do is the question that i would want you to ponder upon friends i would like to leave uh, this conversation by saying a note that this earth is not an asset that we have inherited from our forefathers this earth is a liability that we need to pay with interest to the future generation and uh, i would like to thank uh, chandru gautam and many others in you know kumaraguru college and shankar ayas academy and uh, other institute for giving this uh, uh, opportunity to speak with young minds and to share my thoughts with young minds like you thank you friends i would wait for your questions thank you so much Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your session, uh, sir. Can you throw some lights on uh, how this actually the changes in climate and the behavior of the virus? So, what is the yeah. link between that? Yeah, I, I got a question. See, uh, as I said, Lancet report said the way I, I didn't I forgot to mention one thing. Lancet report also said the way the pathogens spread diseases, the way pathogens behave. will completely change that's what the lancet report says see uh, you know few few decades back when you get a fever for example when you get fever you know your elders would say you are getting fever because the temperature would deactivate the virus right most of the you know elders would say that uh, so otherwise what would happen is your body would generate or would produce antibodies and it will de- deactivate the virus and it will it will you know it will fight the virus and it gets deactivated so once you get an infection you will not get for the second time because the antibodies are there in your body if the body is not able to produce antibodies it is being it will be produced using uh, you know medicines or through vaccines that is how it is done but today the viruses outside what is the body temperature it's roughly about 37.6 that's the average body temperature of humans right so today the outside the out, uh, outside our body temperature is 42 43 44 45 50 degrees also so this viruses outside our body get acclimatized to higher temperatures get acclimatized to get used to higher temperatures like for example i would like to say uh, you know 10 15 years back when you have a mosquito menace okay what you will do you will light up a tortoise or some uh, mosquito coils right 10 years back but today what happens that the mosquito goes and stands on the mosquito coil and starts dancing because the mosquito gets used to the mosquito coils they are immune to mosquito coils likewise the viruses outside the human body gets immune to higher temperatures so when they get inside the body so it's a very conducive environment because the temperature is very low which is very good for viruses to spread 
So since your body temperature is very low, it comes from a higher temperature. The, temp the body environment is very, very conducive. So it spreads widely. And also, uh, now we are able to see uh, you know, reports which says, you know, people who got infected by Corona, again, all, they also get FA, you know, infected after a few months also. You know, reinfection or second time infection. That used, that used not, that generally don't happen with other viruses. So climate change is changing the behavior of viruses. You know, and also since our, you know, outside temperature is very high, these viruses get immune to those higher temperatures. And when it gets inside the body, it's more conducive for virus to spread you know, and mutate like anything. So that is the key uh, effect of climate change on these viruses. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. And we have one, one more question. What uh, could the steps uh, taken to prevent this type of pandemic which occurs? Okay, the question is, uh, you will read the question or should I read the question? No, no, I will read the question for you. Okay. okay. So that is what the question is. They say, what are the steps we need to take in order to prevent this type of pandemics? Because this pandemic is happening for every 100 years once. So uh, according to the question. So what actually we need to do in order to control this pandemics? See, you, we will have to understand. It is not happening every 100 years. Nipah happened in 2013. Ebola happened a few decades back, HIV. These are all pandemics. These are all pandemics which has not yet seen the medicine or which has not seen the cure. So only way to counter this uh, zoonotic viruses is uh, two. There are, we, have, we have to talk about two things. One, hereafter, there is nothing called as uh, you know human health. It has to be one health. One health includes human health, animal health, plant health, and environment health. So one health includes four things. It's no more human health alone because if the wildlife has to be healthy in its environment, the wildlife has to be healthy in its forest. Wildlife has to be it has, to, it has not to be disturbed. Only when you disturb, it gets stressed and you got zoonotic spillover. So you know uh, uh, you'll have to protect forest. You should not deforest. You have to protect forest. You have to bring down the emissions of carbon so that you know climate change does not uh, uh, bring out more um, uh, ancient virus families. You will have to live live in tune with nature. You would have you would have, you would have to bring down your consuming culture. It's a very very important factor. As, as individuals, we have become we have become you know consume hungry or uh, uh, we have become uh, material hungry. You know, I have a friend who has uh, got three members in his family. He, his wife, and his son. They have got seller seven televisions in their home. I don't know why they need uh, seven televisions in their home. We have become a very very material hungry uh, society. So we'll have to go with that. So you know, we, there are a lot of things that we could do. I can, I can, I can tell, talk for hours on how to do it. But main thing is, we will have to see how we can live in tune with nature. Is the, you know, is the key driving point that I would like to say. Okay. And we have a question from Mr. Vengat. So he says that human is a highest evolutionary existence. Now, as an individual, what we have to do in order to uh, control this climate change? Every individual, what they have to do. See, I would like to say that there are two things as every human has to do. One as an individual person, what he or she has to do. And another one as a social person, what he or she has to do. There are two things to it. So the first as an individual person, I would like to tell with a small anecdote. Uh, you know, when Buddha, this is a small anecdote. Don't, don't take it as a real one, but a small anecdote. Uh, when Buddha was there, you know, he went to a, a Buddhist temple. Uh, he saw a Buddhist monk there. So the Buddhist monk would uh, invite him to his uh, small room. And Buddha will go inside and see uh, surroundings and see this Buddhist monk will have a bed sheet which would have a small hole in that bed sheet. So Buddha would say, why are you using this uh, torn bed sheet? So use a new one. So he would hand over a new bed sheet and go. He will come back to the same temple after a couple of years, I mean six months after. And Buddha would ask this monk, uh, are you using um, the bedsheet that I gave you? The monk will say, yes, I'm using that. So what did you do with your old torn bedsheet? Have you thrown it off? And the monk will say, no, I did not throw it off. That torn bedsheet is my bed cover today. So then what happened to the old bed cover? No, the bed cover is the pillow cover today. Okay, so what happened to the pillow cover? The pillow cover is the, you know, uh, doormat at my doorsteps. Okay, so then what happened to the old doormat? The old doormat is the wick of my lamp. It's the wick of my lamp. So friends, this is what we should live as an individual. 
we should refuse we should first first reduce we should say i used to study my books which was given to my my brother my younger sister will read my books my younger brother would read my sister's books that's where our society was so first we would reduce completely reduce we were we were used to use uh, you know ink pens we used to fight for camlin versus hero ink pens i remember those days but today you know every student throws away a renolds pen or ink pen which is not biodegradable you know what they are those are not biodegradable and in tamil nadu we have got about 2 crore students 2 crore students they throw renolds pen every month one pen at such with just one pen every month so every month 2 crore non biodegradable pens are thrown by students of tamil nadu So in a year, 24 crore pens are thrown away. Just imagine this data alone. This data alone. So we have to reduce use ink pens. That is one way. Use old books. No harm. Don't you know? Being frugality is not stinginess. Frugality is not stinginess. Frugality is living very simple. It is stinginess is something different. Live very frugally. Nothing wrong in that. Why do you want about 25 set of dress, 30 set of chapels? Uh, you know, ten set of jean pants, uh, t-shirts, many other things. Why do you need that? So live frugally. So reduce. Reduce is what number one. Then refuse. You refuse. Why do I? Why do I need this? You ask that question. Then reuse again and again. Use it. Then reduce. Sorry. Then recycle it. So these are the four R's that as individuals that you have to keep in mind. But at the same time, you you can be an individually. I am very very you no. Know, environment conscious person i don't use plastics i don't use electricity unnecessarily i don't use uh, i don't go to malls i don't go to huge theaters i don't go to you know ipl matches you know i don't go to that i i i use public transport i use uh, ink pens but at the same time i will not open my mouth if there are any destructive projects brought out by large corporations or government then there is no use of being individually an environment conscious person you know as you are individually an environmental conscious person you have to be as a social human you have to voice your opposition or voice your concern to destructive projects that are brought out by government at the same time you are a, you are a activist you you give your voice but you don't care about environment you flaunt anything you go and you know uh, you you use uh, you drink coke you drink but that's also no use so as an individual human being as good as you are being a environment conscious person you have to be a social human being you will have to voice your concerns which bothers the environment so these are the two things that you have to keep in mind for what you have to do to combat climate change okay sir thank you thank you very much sir and okay. we have a student athira so from the ba political science so the question is what triggers this climate change impact more whether a changing climate or changing non climatic factors okay see um, addition of carbon is a evolution process like if you don't have carbon in this atmosphere this earth would be filled with ice if there had to be full of snow because carbon got accumulated over millions of years the heat that came from sun got trapped here slowly snow started to melt and life started to spring up this is the process of evolution if you don't have carbon the entire world would be of snow age okay so that we have to keep in mind you need carbon i don't deny that but how much is the question for example the scientists have worked out the average carbon in this earth should be 280 ppm 280 parts per million that's the average carbon where there will be no climatic or no global warming not much of global warming global warming is is was there but um, see the issue is the the ppm should be 280 but since 1750 the supposed year that industrial revolution started okay it is dramatically increased and today it is 420 yeah it is 420 if it reaches 440 you cannot repair back the tipping points the tipping point is permafrost thawing is tipping point it is not only raising your temperature but it also you know decreases the uh, arctic ice so it's a tipping point which means the tipping points if it is tipping points then you cannot reverse it back then you cannot reverse it back so climatic factors like this add more when for example if industrial revolution industrial uh, industrial uh, era has not happened just for an argument sake i'm saying since 1750 it has not happened the amount of carbon that would have added would become 300 in the next 10000 or 20000 years 
what we have done is we have hastened that process especially the amount of carbon that we have you know given us output that we have we have emitted is 50% since 1990 where the world embraced globalization you know and wto and many other things so 50% of carbon emission happened after 1990 so it is mostly it is uh, you know anthropogenic driven climate impacts there are very few non climatic factors you know which is beyond our control like you know slowing down of earth and many other factors which is very very minuscule as on today but when it becomes tipping points when it becomes irreversible so that will also add more uh, you know uh, more factors to uh, picking up temperatures and climatic changes okay thank you sir so one more question sir uh, so as you said already we have reached the tipping point am i right the tipping point no, there are there are about uh, uh, there are about nine tipping points which the scientists or climate scientists have said yeah. out of yes. which we have already six tipping points we have already reached there are uh, three more which have got an opportunity to save this earth uh, so that's what so already the climate change is triggered and some scientists say that we cannot stop it at all now in this point definitely this type of pandemic will keep on rising so now what we have to do see um, even today i'm saying even today if you stop emission if your emission becomes zero as i'm today i'm saying i mean it's possible or impossible we all know that i'm saying for argument sake even today if you are able to stop your emission at zero still the temperature rise will be more than 1.5 degrees celsius yes. okay so but what will happen is if it becomes zero over a period of time after 2030 2040 slowly the carbon content will start coming down and you might stabilize at something like about 1.2 1.3 degrees celsius over and above the temperature average temperature during the start of industrial revolution so if you are able, if you are able to do that destruction will happen i mean i i don't want to say that destruction will not happen but it it can be it is it will be it could be tolerable or it could be even face us like now now what we are facing you know corona covid disasters it will be so what we are trying to do now is there are two things one how do you mitigate that how do you mitigate climate change by reducing your carbon emission so that the effect is little less it will not be the government of india ministry of earth sciences report says by turn of century by which means after 2060 2070 the average temperature of india would be about 4.4 degree celsius more than the average temperature during 1750 4.4 actually unfcc has said it should be more it should not it should not be more than 1.5 degree celsius but indian government says if things are going as usual as on today then the average temperature of india would be 4.4 degree celsius which would make the entire gangetic plains you know uh, unlivable or uh, it cannot humans cannot uh, become habitats over there himalayas would lose their ice in the next 20 30 years and the deccan plateau and the kaveri delta will be sinking so you know life would become so miserable you know probably in the next 30 40 years so i think uh, what we have to do is uh, we have to reduce the impact that's what we have to try now we have to reduce the impact is what we can do now okay thank you sir so one more question uh, so recently you know there is a eaa and there is a lot of debate on the eaa and everything uh, so my question is today uh, we have lot of youngster population in india the demographic dividend is very high and we need to create lot of employment so in this context definitely development is needed so we cannot sustain such a huge population such a huge youngsters with agriculture or something we need some sort of industries and everything so anyway we have to go for a sustainable development so now in this context uh, let's take suppose we focus more on afforestation creating more forest will it be a solution will it counter all the developmental degradation and everything see first thing you will believe that humans don't have the capacity to build a forest what you can do is you can only plant trees, trees. you can only plant trees you cannot create forest forest are not just trees there are a lot of microorganisms lot of you know uh, insects pathogens a lot of things are only forest trees are not forest number one and the amount of carbon that the natural forest that could uh, sequester that the natural forest can get the amount of uh, carbon is at least 6 to 8 times more in natural forest than in man made forest that is the difference that you have to understand between you know human beings made forest and natural forest and second thing is see i'll tell you what it is a very it is a false notion that the people are trying to create 
India is a 130 crore population. We need to give jobs. I like to. I like. I, we are not against industries. Please note, we are not against industries. Have we? Have we ever seen we opposing any car industry, any food processing industry, any agro based industry? We don't do that. We need that. I don't deny that fact. But I would. We are, what we are fighting against is there is a mall in Chennai, in Phoenix Mall. We all know in Bellachy. There is a mall called Phoenix Mall. That Phoenix Mall consumes about. 12,000 units of electricity in an hour. In one hour, it consumes 12,000 units of electricity. My village, which is in near, which is near Tenkasi, near Puchalam, consumes about 1,000 units in a day. In one day, it consumes only 1,000 units. So whatever my village requires and needs for 12 days is consumed by Phoenix Mall in one hour. Is it development or is it uh, what? This is the question that I want to raise. This is not development. We are for sustainable development. As J.C. Kumarapa said, India does not require mass production. It requires production by masses. So this should be the development agenda or development goal for a you know, 1.3 billion you know, con populated country. And as Gandhi said, I would like to quote Gandhi, the world has not, world has got enough resources for everyone's need, for everyone's need but not anyone's greed. This is what Mahatma Gandhi, the father of nation said. So there are resources for everybody's need, but not for anyone's greed. So I think greed is the key and demolishing factor as far as environment is concerned. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, then the one question regarding the climate change. So India, we have a NAPCC, National Action Plan on Climate Change. So we are doing it and we are spending a lot of money on this to counter this climate change. So what is your opinion on this NAPCC? Uh, what, whether do you feel it is a successful program or what has to be done? See, according to me or our group, we have done a lot of work on climate change. So I can say that the national action plan is not sufficient. It's not sufficient, number one. Even if you take it as for argument's sake, it is sufficient. We are not doing or we are not keeping up the word that we have committed ourselves to COP Paris, COP 2015 Paris Agreement, where we have said that by 2030, our carbon emission would drop by 30% from the 2005 levels. Whatever emission that we did in 2005, our emission would drop about 30% by 2030. Actually, we are adding more. You know, we are starting thermo our Prime Minister by the name of Atman Nirbar Bharat as uh, you know, auctioned about 50 coal mines in central India, which would destroy about 1,70,000 hectares of forest land in central India. And Germany has agreed, has announced that by 2038, in another 18 years, they would shut down all their coal power plants. Great Britain, Great Britain has announced in the next five years, they will shut down all their coal power plants. This is on one side. The global leaders are doing that. On this side, India is auctioning for 50 coal mines, I mean, which means uh, we are we are uh, not walking the talk. Though we have committed to Paris uh, COP15, though we have done our NDCs, which is nationally determined contribution through National Action Plan on Climate Change, either we are not adhering to our own plans or we are not walking the talk. I think we need to do a lot more to combat climate change as a nation, as a country of 1.3 billion population. Okay, thank you, sir. So as an environmentalist, uh, so do you think that uh, this type of pandemics in future, whether it be more, suppose if it is more, actually what we have to do now? Whether it don't don't give me this doomsday or tack to me. Hmm. Don't give this doomsday or tack to me. <laughs> but okay. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person who always would want to caution the society, I would say, if it is business as usual, if you are going to do the same thing, cut forest, destroy for deforestation, it is not just like COVID-19. We will have much worse pandemics in this near future. Please don't give me this tag. I'm just cautioning this uh, country, cautioning the society. If you don't stop deforestation, if you don't mitigate climate change, I think uh, we will enter the mass extinction phase now or sooner. Now or sooner. So do we need to have any separate policy or something like this? Or do you have any idea? See, I would, we would suggest that uh, climate change should be the center point for any policy, for any any change, for any 
projects for anything that this country and the government tries to do. Climate change should be central. If you, if, for example, if you announce a policy, you will have to see it from the climate change perspective. If you, if you announce any project, you will have to see it from the climate change perspective. So, you know, have this climate change glass on you always. See any project, any policy with the, with the glass of climate change, whether this will try to mitigate or whether this will enhance the, uh, you know, effects of climate change or it will mitigate or adapt. Adaption is one, you know, we don't, we don't build anything adaptive. You know, climate change is real. The destruction and the, and the, and the uh, you know, all the uh, evil things that are going to happen are true. As a society, are we adapting to it? No. We are not doing it. You know, I would like to say that, you know, luckily, Fani, last year, Fani storm or Fani cyclone, which crossed Orissa, luckily did not cross Tamil Nadu. If we had, if Fani cyclone had crossed the coast of Tamil Nadu, then at least we would have lost about 10,000 people in that Fani storm, Fani cyclone. You know, because Orissa had a robust disaster management uh, structure, they were able to evacuate about 14 to 15 lakh people in 24 hours so that the Fani uh, cyclone did not cause much of a loss to lives when in last year. Waki, you know, the cyclones are changing. They're, they're, their character is changing. Usually when there's a depression depression that gets formed in the, you know, in Bay of Bengal or in the, now it is happening in Arabian Sea also. But when, whenever, usually when there's a depression that gets formed, in the next two, four to seven days time, it will cross the coast. That is the general character of any cyclone storm. But Fani took 11 days. It was in ocean for 11 days. Because it was in ocean for 11 days, because of the thermal expansion and more of, uh, you know, uh, more of uh, uh, um, heat that becomes, uh, that evaporates more water, there's a lot of moisture content on, in the atmosphere. So when the cyclone was slowly moving, a lot of moisture content it carried and it took it, it like, you know, it, it gave a huge uh, push when it crossed the uh, Odisha uh, shores and a huge downpour in Bhunesh where Katak and many other places because Fani took 11 days to cross. Same way, Woki, which crossed the Kanyakumari district in Tamil Nadu. And when, whenever there is a depression or a low, low, low depression, it, it takes roughly about 40 to 72 hours to become a cyclone or a storm. But in Woki, it just took six hours from a depression to a cyclone. So that is why we were not able to inform our deep sea fish, fishing community people from Tutur village from Kanyakumari district. And we lost more than 1,000 fishermen in Woki. So the character of cyclones are changing. The character of uh, uh, you know winds are changing. The character, the nature, the na why why uh, a landslide in Munar uh, got killed uh, about 80 people because the immunity to landslides, the soil's immunity to landslide is lost. We have the soil has lost lost its immunity for landslides because of mining, because of plantation change, because of vegetation change, because of our intervention. The reasons could be many. But the soil has lost its immunity to landslides. So climate change, I think, uh, is definitely a question. It's questioning our existence. It is not like your, uh, you know, new education policy, which you would change when time comes or something else. Climate change is questioning our existence. In Tamil, if I say, it is questioning our existence. I think that's the primary thing that we need to have in mind before we get into any project or any policy. Thank you, sir. There is a question from uh, a student, I uh, The question is, uh, uh, it is said that uh, agriculture is contributing to more greenhouse emission. So if we go for organic or natural farming, whether uh, it will be a sustainable way, that is a sustainable agriculture. And at the same time, can it ensure the food security? See, um, inorganic farming or chemical-based farming only help to you know overcome India's food security is a myth. It's a myth. You know, when India faced a food shortage, there are a lot of food grains that were exported from Calcutta port. There are reports uh, which suggest that. Uh, we, did, we had a diverse crops. The problem was not production. The problem was distribution. Always we had this problem. We, we didn't have any problem in production. The problem was only distribution. How you distribute to people? Even today, people on the one hand die out of starvation. On the other hand, we have got... Uh, you know, two times more time, two or three times more than our strategic reserves. Strategic reserves are one which are kept even for, you know, floods or for during war times, we have a strategic reserves. We are having two times, three times more than a strategic reserve even today. But on the other side, there are people who die out of starvation. So the question of uh, green revolution or so-called 
inorganic uh, uh, food production you know only solved india's food uh, only you know ensured food security is a myth uh, you know people, reports are there uh, which disproves that theory number 2 yes organic farming gives the soil to sequence carbon it, it it pulls down carbon from atmosphere and it stores in the soil so organic farming definitely helps to combat or to mitigate climate change definitely you know and also it can ensure food security the diversity in the crops see we had about what you know as far as i remember india had 1 lakh diverse crops 1 lakh you know there's a temple in puri jagna temple every year 365 days a year it will not eat the, the they give prasadams right to they offer food to deity so each day will have different grain different variety for so one grain will repeat only after one year so they had such a diverse crops but today we are having only ir8 ir64 ir8 all what is ir ir is at international rice research institute in manila in philippines which america got formed so that we will get dwarf varieties and we will we will import uh, chemicals and fertilizers in terms of ammonia and phosphate so that is what ir8 and ir64 is unfortunately we we went behind uh, those rulers of those time went behind this kind of varieties in name of food security so definitely organic farming and natural farming will combat will will reduce will mitigate climate change no doubt on that okay sir so thank you so you say that organic farming itself can provide us the food security exactly yeah, yeah. okay sir nice nice so that's another one question on this climate change uh actually uh, do you think that we have all the technology for this combating climate change because in the international convention we are fighting for technology transfer and we are fighting for money you know that so in this context right now india has a sufficient technology to combat this climate change so that in future this type of pandemic may not occur so what is your opinion say i i don't think uh, we have all the technologies but definitely there are few technologies there are for example solar wind and other renewables uh, organic farming so these are these are solutions that uh, you know we are, again again we are making a mistake you know see renewable energy also should not be centralized produce you know it should not be produced centrally it should be distributed every rooftop you should have a solar panel every every uh, locality should have a power station you know small 0.5 megawatt or 1 megawatt of solar power wind power combination hybrid systems ocean thermal ocean waves there are a lot of technologies that we have the, the global has, the global has got india might lag in few technologies that is why india is fighting for fighting to as a, you know common but differentiating responsibility cbdr uh, 2015 uh, cop on paris conference of parties in paris paris said cbdr conf, uh, you know common but differentiating responsibilities what are what is common climate change is common for all countries like for mauritius for maldives for vanuatu for india for us climate change is common but what is the differentiating responsibilities as european nations as america they have spoiled or they have utilized the carbon budget or the carbon emission they have utilized much before than developing countries like us came into industrial mode so it is their responsibility to transfer technology and to give money uh, you know uh, for combating climate change because the effect is going to be changed for america for india for same so but the differentiating responsibility is india and other countries should get funding and should get technologies at a lower cost without any patents so that we will also have a, you know a role to combat climate change definitely there are technologies you know globally the first city in this world to be a climate proof city is rotterdam in netherlands you know i was i was laughing at ourselves because i studied about rotterdam what they are doing they are building reservoirs because there will be you know short term short time intense rainfalls you know three months of rain will fall in three days time so they will have to store the water for their you know Uh, future use or you know coming days use so they are building reservoirs under public places so uh, on top it will be a public park at the bottom they will have a reservoir it could be a parking lot they will have a reservoir imagine na huh? in tamil nadu we had about 39000 water bodies in in tamil nadu we had our forefathers have thought about this and built water bodies like 39400 water bodies across you no know, thousands of years you know uh, in chennai bugapur we have got a Air scheme. We didn't ask how an airy could become a scheme, you know. So all the bus stands that we are building now are built on water bodies. Whereas Rotterdam, they claim to be the first climate-proof city in this world, is building reservoirs to store water. Is it not? Uh, you know, it, it, I can only uh, laugh us, laugh at us, because we are such a environment-friendly society. We bear an environment-friendly society. 
and uh, you know a city called luxembourg it's a city country the country is a, it's a city they have announced public transport as free of cost you can travel in trams you know uh, metros buses everything is free of cost so what they have calculated is for every euro that they invest in public transport the pollution level come down so they are able to save about 7 euros from investing from public health because they invest more in public transport you don't have to invest in public health you save lot of money so they have announced to public transport is free of cost you can go anywhere in public transport without paying 1 rupee so that people will avoid using private vehicles and they will start using public vehicles okay sir thank you sir. so and uh, your general advice to all the aspirants who are watching this uh i mean i don't i don't want to call it as an advice but i would like to uh, say a word of a matter of concern uh, as i said earlier see you would be a civil servant uh, probably in a year or two uh, you be a civil servant i'm sure many of you who would listen to this would be civil servant in the next year or two so have this in mind anything can be corrected you could do a software company you could do an engineering college you could build a television studio you could be, you could run a political party you could run a transport company anything you can do but if you don't have concern for environment doing rest of things doesn't matter whether you do it or not doesn't matter because only if you live and survive in this earth you can run a software company you can be a bus transport owner whatever it is so as a civil servant as a would be civil servant i would want you to have this glass of environment have this glass of climate change on anything that you do i can quote lot of projects that would have jeopardized environment in a bad way have been stopped by environment friendly bureaucrats i can quote many examples i don't want to name them but the silent valley project in kerala was stopped because of a bureaucrat because of a bureaucrat there are many the the new neutrino project in in uh, tane district has been you know halted once we have got the stay in court but there are a lot of bureaucrats who understood the issue and they have also you know said okay we don't have to have this problem so as being bureaucrats you have got tremendous responsibility whenever you have a file when you browse through a file put this glass of climate change put this glass of environment how this project or this policy or this rule or this regulation anything could affect or affect environment climate change so have that one bit of idea always in your mind when you become a civil servant and decide because you are one signature will decide the life of millions of people you have to understand that you have to keep this in mind so please do that no Yeah. wonderful sir thank you so much it's i mean your session has really been insightful in fact this is the fifth session we've attended in this entire series and today you have really put in some thought provoking uh, insights into our mind it's true today we are living on this planet as if we have another one to go to my warm greetings to everyone present here i'm ananda kartik from uh, department of visual communication from kumaru guru college of digital arts and science we are also listening to you sir it's very good and it's very interesting for us to have a wholesome experience to understand these aspects too first of all i would like to thank you sir for this informative session on climate change and pandemic thank you so much for taking out your time from your busy schedule and you know educating our students from all the different departments we are watching you and especially the civil service uh, aspirants the session has really given us so uh, significant information about the history of pandemics and it's really made us you know triggered us to think about uh, habitat loss urbanization illegal meat trade and you know all the different uh, things that are causing the spread of pandemics as we're going through this crisis today this topic is so relevant for us and i'm so happy that you could share in your specific real life examples with us we also have uh, mr vijay the environmental faculty from uh, shankar ayers academy thank you so much sir for your thank service you. thank you so much for being a moderator for today's session and for just making everything so smooth throughout a heartfelt thank you to you too sir thank i would you. also like to put on record uh, a sincere thank you to kclas and kumaruguru institutions for organizing this wonderful webinar series for the students 
really making them think beyond their classroom i think that's so important and especially to aid the study process of the civil service aspirants also i would also like to extend a sincere thanks to shankar ayers academy who've been the backbone of the entire program and to our knowledge partner takshashila institutions for their contribution and support lastly but not the least i would like to thank all you participants and the various aspirants for and would like to wholeheartedly welcome you to our evening session today at 5 pm on the topic walk the path walk the path of your ips dream by uh, r aditya ips thank you all have a great day and uh, see you all at 5 o'clock thank you thank you